Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to see everyone made it here. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Jeff Kaufman. I'm an analyst with Vertical Research Partners, and uh, I cover transportation logistics, transportation equipment, and transportation technology. Um, this summer marks my 34th year of doing so, and I also write a bi-monthly column for those of you that read Heavy Duty Truck Magazine uh, called Behind the Numbers. Um, I have the honor this afternoon of helping kick off CDK uh, Truck Connect and be here on the stage with Peter Kahn, who's going to discuss with you the results of his dealership survey. Um, I'm going to compliment this, or at least try to, uh, by providing you a vision of the trucking and equipment markets over the next 12 to 24 months and the potential implications for commercial vehicle equipment demand as it may or may not impact your dealerships. So I hope you find some value add in some of the things we're going to throw up here. Um, I'm also going to spend a little bit of time on new vehicle technology and some of the environmental changes that may be on your minds as commercial vehicle dealers. Uh, that's something that's popped up uh, talking to truck dealers lately. Um, I'd like to also thank Brian McDonald, the uh, president and CEO of CDK, as well as Dave Carson, who was just on the stage, uh, vice president of Heavy Truck and your main MC over the next few days, uh, and the marketing team at CDK as well for asking me to join you in what looks to be a really interesting and information-filled uh, next two or three days here at CDK Truck Connect. Before I start, I guess I want to throw this out there, and, and don't be bashful. Anybody yell up and answer if you have it. Um, before I start, I'm just kind of curious. There are two phrases, four words in length, that, in my opinion, are two of the most expensive phrases in the English language. Now, the first is, I want a divorce. <laughs> so that's not the answer I'm seeking, but I'm wondering if anybody can give me the second. What is it? Uh, <laughs> you know, four words. You need four words. Um, anybody? Let's buy a boat. Let's buy a boat. <laughs> Actually, worse than that, worse than that. Those four words are, this time, it's different. And I'm hearing that from a lot of truck OEs. Uh, a lot of people are saying there won't be a recession in the truck equipment industry, best recession ever is something I'm hearing other people say, so I want to go ahead and explore that in the course of the slides. So uh, let's start out with the current environment. So I'm going to start with the conclusion, and then I'm going to go back in and talk about some of the details. By no measure that I use to evaluate the freight markets do we appear to be in a recession at this time. Now, we have a lot of negative shipment volumes because of a very large inventory correction that's going on right now in retail and chemical and a whole bunch of other industries. And, and maybe history proves us wrong. Uh, as the volumes are down right now and there's pressure on rates in the trucking market, and there's a lot to fear, right? High inflation, uh, Federal Reserve still raising rates, and a lot of the talking heads on TV debate whether or not they should be. A banking crisis, uh, not just here but in Europe. Uh, still limitations on supply chains and getting parts that are needed for vehicles uh, when you need them. Uh, there's war in the world. Uh, there are trade blocks that are forming. Everyone's talking about US, EU versus China, Russia, India. Um, and a pretty massive inventory reduction that is occurring. But when I look at a lot of the key drivers of our general economic activity, um, most businesses are in a solid financial position and continue to hire. They're hiring a little more slowly, but they're continuing to hire. Unemployment still remains pretty low, pretty healthy. Consumer credit still remains viable. Most of our credit cards uh, we can still use. The government stimulus is still pretty significant. Uh, housing and rental prices, even though people talk about how housing demand is down, prices have still been going up. Uh, and wages continue to march higher. And many retailers that I speak to, trucking companies that I speak to, believe really the only thing that's a problem right now is this inventory adjustment, and we should come out of that shortly. Uh, but it was interesting, a company called J.B. Hunt released earnings last night, and they're backing off of that view a little bit, and they're getting a little nervous about the concept of a second half bounce a little later this year. We'll discuss that a little more later. But there's no doubt, I think in my mind, and you may be seeing it in some of your businesses, that the velocity of our economy is slowing down. 
Retail sales and consumer spending are decelerating, business conditions are decaying, and I think the eventual outcome of this Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse uh, banking crisis is that lending standards will tighten. Um, and you're gonna see it slowly, but then you're gonna look back and say, wow, it's a lot tougher to get credit than it used to be. Uh, the stimulus programs are still out there, but they're fading. And household income and wealth is down, uh, down over the past year. So we've seen layoff announcements. A lot of these announcements have been largely restricted to technology, but now they're starting to happen in real businesses, uh, starting to happen in the industrial space a little bit more. So let's keep our eyes open. Let's see what's going on. It's my experience that history doesn't repeat. It, it's never exactly the same, but it does rhyme. And there are certain things that I look for in the course of that rhyme to say, okay, how are my tripwires doing? And are my tripwires going off and what are they telling me? So I'm gonna talk about some of the tripwires that are being triggered in truck freight. Because truck freight is a leading economic indicator. And truck freight leads rail freight, and rail freight leads industrial activity, and industrial activity leads corporate profits. And those are very important relationships to keep in the back of your mind. So one of the things I look for is the Institute for Supply Managers PMI index. Is it below 50? And I apologize if I'm throwing out some things a lot of you don't follow that often, but these are the things that I look at to try to figure out what's going on. And yes, not only is it below 50, it's at 46, which I'll show you in a couple charts, is, is not a healthy level. And it has negative implications for truck tonnage in the next three to six months. The yield curve is inverted. You're probably hearing a lot about this on TV and people are talking about it. The yield curve itself does not cause a recession, but in the presence of a lot of other factors, it indicates, you know, hey, Doc, it hurts when I go like this. Well, there's probably a reason, and the inverted yield curve is one of those reasons. Uh, not that it hurts when I go like this, but something to keep in mind. Um, we've just entered what I think is a profits recession. And this is important because profits matter. Profits are what dictate cash flows, and cash flows are what dictate activity. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Um, some of the more mundane things I look at, weight per shipment for LTL companies is deteriorating. That means we're going from 50 hair dryers on a pallet to 49 and 48, which is a bit of a leading economic indicator. Truckload empty miles are rising, which means you have to drive a little further to get that next load of freight. And rental fleet utilization is starting to slow. Uh, gains on equipment sales. Uh, a lot of you equipment sales are very important because it represents trading collateral for your customers. That's still healthy, but it's declining. And uh, spot truck rates, which is something we keep an eye on, have kind of leveled out, but they're not getting better. And this is a time of year where they should be getting better. So it just shows kind of an absence of a catalyst to move forward in the market. And as many of you are dealing with at your dealerships, but also a lot of the truckers are dealing with, we're still paying more for labor, we're still paying more for insurance, and we're paying a lot more for maintenance. So these are some of the things I look at, and, and it's not just one or two, I've got seven or eight that are all going off. Now, we're still missing some important catalysts that haven't taken a seat at the table to really kind of consider, okay, we may be getting into recession territory, but they're close. Industrial production is right around the zero level. It's not yet negative, but it's getting close. And then equipment cancellations are still pretty low by historical standards, less than 1% of backlog but they used to be half a percent of backlog or three-tenths of a percent of backlog. And I don't get alarmed till they get over two or three percent of backlog, but they're up. And that's something to keep an eye on. Now, I know there's some truck OEs in the audience, um, and I know they're keeping you all on allocation this year, and they're telling you how tight things are, but I can tell you, speaking to truckers, that I'm getting feedback that those calls are starting saying, hey, got a couple production slots that are opening up. Are you interested? Now, not enough to say there's a problem, but again, it's one of those things I watch. And that's normally something I hear when things are really beginning to slow down. So let's talk about the slowdown. So in terms of the slowdown, there are parts of the economy that are weak. There are parts of the economy that are actually really, really strong. So where we're seeing the slowdown right now is housing, which is impacting lumber and furniture demand, appliance demand. We're seeing a slowdown in advertising, uh, and a lot of technology companies raised a lot of money and then kind of overgrew 
and now they're in the process of correcting. Where it's slow, but companies are telling me this is mostly because the inventory adjustment would be things like chemicals, uh, retailers, uh, which impacts corrugated box demand, as well as some areas of manufacturing. And then there's the industries that are still kind of robust. And either they've got backlog supply chains, like truck OEs, because we were missing semi-chips, we were missing parts, we couldn't produce enough, and now those things are here and, and we're ramping up production. Um, so we're seeing that in automotive, we're seeing it in truck OEs, uh, we're seeing it in uh, aggregates and construction materials, aerospace defense, energy petroleum, and then the consumer travel areas like uh, hotels, cruise ships, conventions, um, and trade shows. So you know, not all things are bad, you know, even though we're getting tripwires, but you want to watch the trend, and that's what we're going to discuss. So there's been an increasing hope since the Silicon Valley bank uh, crisis that we can avoid the recession. And hey, we're not going to have a recession because we had a banking crisis and the government stepped up and contained it, and we're going to be okay because the Fed's going to cut rates and they're not going to let this economy go into a recession. Um, I don't buy that. I really don't buy that. And we have a view that the recession's still coming and it's going to start in the second half of this year and continue into early 2024. Now, I'm going to oversimplify things a little here, but I think the path of that downturn depends on three things that are kind of interconnected and then one that has nothing to do with any of these. So number one is the path of inflation. Now while headline inflation is declining, it's gone from 8.7% to 5%, core inflation is still pretty high. Shelter costs are still rising and it's the glide path down of that that I think is gonna dictate when the Federal Reserve stops raising rates and I don't think they're gonna stop raising rates right away. The second, in our view, is the way that you beat these shelter costs and you, and you bring down the cost of rising housing, mortgages, rentals, is you got to attack labor cost inflation. And the trick is, the only way you do that is to slow the economy and slow hiring and maybe even get us into a position where companies are firing. So you got to attack corporate profits. So the trick is, can you slow it down enough to bring down these shelter costs that are causing high inflation without triggering a financial crisis. Lastly, our consumer is about 70% of the economy. So what happens to behavior of co consumer spending is credit tightens and wage growth slows. So some of the things I look for is I look at grocery stores and I say, okay, who's going from steak to hamburger, hamburger to chicken, chicken to turkey, turkey to soup? So those are the trade downs that I'm watching for at the consumer level to kind of confirm what's going on in our economy. Now, the big one is the unconnected event. And I want to talk about that for a second. Um, because I'm going to refer to this as, as unintended consequences, or what Donald Rumsfeld used to call the unknown unknowns. Most recessions are relatively mundane until we have the unintended consequence. And that occurs and then it turbocharges what was generally a benign downturn into something a little more nefarious. And I want to just go back over the last few recessions and talk about this. So during the Great Recession of 08-09, um, it was really the collapse of Lehman that triggered the credit crisis that led to the failure of credit and most major banks that caused what was kind of a benign recession in 08 to become a very deep recession that lasted into almost 010. In the recession of 2001, it wasn't the meltdown of the dot-com bubble, it was 9-11. And the fraud that was uncovered at Enron and a couple other companies that caused this crisis of confidence that actually led to this two-year morass in lending and markets. During the recession of 1990, it was a savings and loan collapse and the fall of the junk bond markets. Anyone remembers Mike Milliken and Drexel and LBOs and things like that. And, and that's really what took that to a new level. So the question is, what collateral damage are we going to encounter that turns into an unintended consequence? Is it the collapse of FTX and the crypto market? No, wasn't that. How about the failure of Silicon Valley Bank? I think a lot of people want to say that was it. No, it wasn't it, because then we followed with some banks in New York and then a bank in Europe. I, I don't know that this banking credit crisis is contained. And I think if things get worse, it shows back up. But the market seems to have moved beyond that. Or what about the debt ceiling discussion? That's getting a lot of headlines right now. 
We got Republicans who are convinced we're not gonna let the Democrats raise a debt ceiling unless we get these things and we're willing to go to the mattresses. And I got Democrats that believe, well, if we get an inch away from a collapse of the federal government, we can blame the Republicans. And it's a victory for us. And the problem is you skate too close to that edge on the thin ice and maybe something bad happens that you didn't expect. So there's a lot of things out there to be concerned about. I don't know what it's going to be, but that's kind of one of the things to keep your eye on. Not so much the Fed and interest rates, but kind of what kinds of crises are going to occur as a result of what we're doing that are going to slide down into something a little, little worse. Now, Jamie Dimon is the chief executive officer of J.P. Morgan. He likes to talk a lot. So he was talking last week about his view of the economy. He thinks there's going to be a recession. I'm just throwing up his bullets. I apologize. A lot of news. But basically, it's everything we hit, except he's focusing a little bit more on the external geopolitical environment, right? What happens if China goes after Taiwan and, and we get a trade war or something like that? But just to throw that out there. Now, I want to focus for a couple minutes on some of the big picture fears, because I think some big topics that you're dealing with with your dealerships are cost inflation and higher interest rates and financing our floor plan and things like that. So, you know, what are our thoughts on inflation? What are our thoughts on corporate profits? So I'm just going to hit this briefly and then we'll go into more industry specific things. So inflation seems to be the hot topic in the news. So let's tackle that first. So what this slide does is it actually breaks down the components of inflation. So you can see what's helping and what's hurting. And the bubbles represent the size, how big it is. So to the right, it matters more. To the left, it matters less. And then the arrows represent the direction over the last nine to 10 months. So this kind of gets to my point. You see that big drop in energy prices on the far left of the chart. So of the 3.7 percentage points I talked about from 8.7 to 5 since last May, 3.4 of those 3.7 was simply the cost of lower energy prices. That was it. That's actually accounted for 90% of the difference. So my point simply here is when I say the easy part of inflation has been conquered, that's what I mean, right? We've broken energy prices. But what we haven't really broken our shelter cost, and it's one of the biggest components that we're dealing with. We're starting to see food start to go down a little bit. Transport costs are still rising. So there's still a lot of work to do, and that's why I don't think the Federal Reserve's done. Um, to beat shelter, as I mentioned, wage growth has to be conquered. And the only way to do this is to slow job growth, and to do that, you have to slow corporate profits. This is the part where it's very tough to stick that landing, like a gymnast at the Olympics. Often, you go, the pendulum just swings a little too far to the left, and we end up with a recession or a deeper economy than we were worried about. And that's our concern, is the Fed is not worried about a recession. The Fed is worried about inflation. And if we're in a recession and they still don't think inflation's been beaten, they're going to keep raising. And I don't know that everyone gets that. Um, so the glide path is something we want to focus on. Now, let me look at it a different way. And this shows you the headline inflation number, the blue line, versus what I call core inflation, which is the dotted line with the orange triangles. And core inflation takes out food and takes out energy and kind of looks at the basic components of what's core to what most people are, are consuming. And you can see we haven't made as much progress there. In fact, it's going up, not down. So the headline number looks great, but the core number, I think there's a lot of work to do. Now, let me talk a little bit about our leadership in financial markets. So this is the dot plot, if any of you have heard about this. So that's all the different people who serve on the Federal Reserve have a view of what interest rates are going to do over the next couple of years. And here's the point I want to make. The thick black numbers represent what expectations were last summer. The circles represent where it was as of the most recent outcome. In the case of 22, that's history. So they were thinking 3.4, it ended up at 4.2. They were 20% low. For 2023, they were thinking 3.8, and now expectations are 5.2. They were 30% low. So I guess the question I have is, do our government, do our economists, do our people that are in charge of interest rate policy have their arms around where inflation's really going yet? Because my concern is I have trouble getting the 2.5%, but that's where they are and they've stayed there. 
And I'm not so sure it's so easy to get there. All right, let me switch gears. And I apologize, because this is going to make your head spin, all right? I, I get it. <laughs> you know? There was a five-year-old kid. One of the guys in our firm drew this. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense. i got to put this in a slideshow. Um, so let me explain this, because it's actually a really cool chart. So what this measures is the rate of inventory growth east and west. So to the right, inventories grow faster. To the left, they're growing slower, shrinking, versus industrial production. To the north, it's growing faster. To the bottom, it's growing slower. So what this really captures is the, uh, the business cycle. And up and right is good, and down and left is bad. And I show the last five economic cycles. Each is a different color. So you get an idea of kind of where the out-of-bounds markers are. Right? So this is where industrial activity tends to peak. This is where it tends to trough. Here's where inventories tend to level out. And you can see we went way right of that. And here's where they tend to go. Now, there's two things I want to point out, OK? X1 is where we think we are as of March. X2 is where we think we end the year. And what's important is we've never been in the lower left column except in a recession. So if that's where we're going, We've never been there and not been in a recession. We're talking industrial production down 4 or 5%. We're talking inventory shrinking. Um, I try on the chart on the right to say, OK, well, inventory is measured in dollars, and we know there's inflation in inventory. So let me try and strip out the inflation. So I don't know if I got it right or not. But just to give you an idea of what we look like on units, right? So it's not as severe on units. But the point is, to get from X1 to X2, we have to walk through a part of the forest called zone of concern. And zone of concern is when our economic output is negative, but we still have things to do to fix the system. And this is where bad things happen. This is where Lehman happened. This is where Enron happened. This is where the unintended consequences, whatever they may be, tend to present themselves. So the point I want to make here is there's talk out there that inventories are in the right place. Our numbers say no. In fact, we think we're still going to be taking down inventory for the better part of the next six months, at least, because we're not where we need to be. Uh, we're not in a position to resume growth right now. So I just wanted to show that up visually. See, this chart makes more sense now. It's, it's still crazy, but makes a little more sense now. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about profits. And corporate profits really matter, because this is where you have the cash to hire people. This is where you have the cash to spend on new trucks or new technologies. Uh, this is where you have the cash to say, OK, we're going to hire some consultants. You guys go travel to conferences. We're going to do all kinds of cool things. And when this comes under pressure, and you can see what it looks like in a true recession, right? We're not there yet. But we're very clearly headed in that zip code. And we're currently at a place where we don't normally spend time. Expectations for earnings this year, and I'm going to use the S&P 500 earnings number because that's the best measure of major corporations, was for 7% growth this year. We're only four months into the year, and that number has already become 3% decline. We're worried you could get to that 10% decline level, and that's really kind of in line with other recessions. And if that's where we get, the unemployment rate is not going from 3.5 to 4.2. It's going to six and a half. And you're going to see class eight orders be down 30, 35, 40%. And I know none of the truck OEs believe that can happen because we've got pent up demand and we got backlog. But you got backlog until you don't. And that's why I'm looking at cancellations and I'm very focused on this. Now, we're going to go ahead and handicap everything I put together. And we run a lot of scenarios. And where we come out is we think we got a 60% chance of being in a mild recession in the second half of this year. But I want to point out something important here. We think the odds of having something better than this are about equivalent to the odds of having something worse than this. And nobody ever forecasts a severe recession. But this is kind of where we are right now. And what's interesting to me is, and I'm going to show you a chart on the difference between a bad recession and a good recession. 
When I look at 2024, most companies have this humongous bounce back in earnings, 16% right now. So there's no way that anybody that's forecasting 24 is worried about a difficult environment right now. And I think that's something just to put in the back of your mind and think about as you're building your plans. Because if I'm right about where we're going in the second half of this year, and I could be wrong, then it's going to carry into 24 and there's no way we're bouncing back to peak of cycle margins in six months. So what changes our mind? Well, there's a lot of things that can make this better. There's a lot of things that can make this worse. As I always joke with, with the guys that work for me, whatever we forecast today is going to be wrong tomorrow. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Don't stress about the forecast. But you need to have a plan. And you need to have a reasonable basis for it. And hope is not a strategy. So let's talk about what can go right and wrong. So some of the key factors that can make this a little bit better than necessary is if we can weather the economic slowdown and reduce shelter costs. I think that's the big thing. At that point, the Fed says, OK, inflation's coming down. Inflation's under control. We're feeling pretty good about it. Uh, and maybe this COVID being taken out of, of stifling the Chinese economy brings China roaring back. Maybe we've got a new consumer in the global marketplace. This can all make things better. Um, but again, I want to make it clear, I think to our financial leadership, defeating inflation is more important than having a healthy economy right now. And if we are defeating, we're not defeating inflation, but the economy is weak, the worst mistake they can make is to blink, lower rates, throw liquidity in the system, and then we have a weak economy and we still have an inflation problem. And that's the outcome that they don't want. No shortage of things that can make it worse. I think I don't have to take you through that list, but just a lot of scary things out there. So I just want to throw a reminder out because I don't think 2020 was a true recession. You know, it got bad for a couple months. We had a shutdown, but then it got really, really good really fast. We had some slowdowns in 15 and 19, but really the last time we had a real recession in this industry was almost 15 years ago. And not everybody remembers that. In fact, a lot of people probably weren't in this industry 15 years ago. So I just want to remind you what one looks like, all right? You go back to 07, 08, 09. You go back to 2000, 2001. Um, normally, when we get a downturn in this market, it tends to last a little longer than six months. You know, two to three years is typically what we'll see. Now, we do have overbuilds during that time. We did have some artificial downturns created by EPA mandates and these massive pre-buys. But um, I just want to show you what a real recession looks like. And I'm going to show you a different way here. So if I look at the last four major recessions, going back to 1980, and I'm going to separate them from mild recessions to deep recessions, I just want to show you the difference between them, because it's been a while since we've had one. So a severe recession lasts about twice as long, almost a year and a half. We'll see three times the negative effect to GDP in industrial production. I'll see two and a half times to three times the downturn in freight shipments. And then the one on the right, that's the important one, class eight orders. We've never had a true recession where class eight orders were not down 30%. If that happens in 24, and there is a pathway to it not happening, and there is some legitimacy to best recession ever, but if it happens, I don't think anyone has down 30% on their bingo card for next year. And we've never had a recession where it wasn't down 30%. So just something to think about. All right, so let me talk about what this means for trucking markets and what it means for trucking demand. And you know, I know most of you are looking forward to two or three drinks now at cocktail hour with that first part. Um, but you know, listen, the, the worst thing I can do is put panda ears on and say it's all going to be fine, right? Um, what I want to discuss are things to think about. And if you decide, Jeff, you're wrong, we know better, we see the order book, then that's fine. I, I just want to get you to think about it. So, I'm going to take it from 30,000 feet down to 5,000 feet, and we're going to look at the tea leaves for the freight sector and trucking. So I uh, apologize, these are busy charts, but um, any leading indicator of truck demand and profits, we expect the environment to continue to deteriorate. And I can tell you, I've had two truckers release earnings in the last 24 hours, and the thing that was unexpectedly bad 
was rates. Rates are down 15, 17% for the two truckers that have released earnings so far. We were thinking down five to seven. So the environment is deteriorating very rapidly for truck carriers right now. Now, some argue the demand in 4Q and 1Q is entirely inventory right sizing. There may be some truth to that on the volume side. I don't disagree with that. Um, so maybe instead of going lower from here, we don't get that spring bounce that a lot of people were asking for, but the whole economy is betting on a second half bounce. So my question is, in, instead of going like this, what if we end up going like this? It gets a little better, but, but way below forecast. Um, because right now, and the chart on the upper left is kind of covering this, um, spot rates are $1.50 per mile, operating costs are $1.72. We cannot continue to operate with that kind of spread. And the reason it's continuing is because small fleets are losing money hand over fist, but the lenders don't want to take the trucks back. So they're continuing to stay in those market with trucks they're underwater in, $40,000 underwater from what I'm hearing. They're operating their business at rates they cannot afford to stay in business, but the banks and the lenders and maybe if your dealerships are fine, you don't want the trucks back right now. So they're continuing to operate in that market with trucks in other words, we got pressure on profits and it's going to affect the whole industry and we're not coming out of it just yet. But whether I look at shipments, whether I look at the purchasing managers index, the index of leading economic indicators, you can see on these charts, there's a really consistent relationship and they lead truck tonnage. So yeah, I'm a little nervous about truck tonnage in the second half of the year. In terms of macro freight indicators, I got my negative yield curve on the upper left. Now the institutional Supply Managers Index, I, I don't know, maybe some of you peek at it, maybe some of you don't. But the point I want to make here is you see where we are, the green circle. Red circle's a recession. Blue circle is a soft landing, not really a recession. And we're beyond blue circle territory. We're not yet at red, but we're way beyond blue. If I look at imports and exports, they look horrible right now, probably getting better in the next few months now that China's more active. Um, and industrial production and rail car loads are both signaling uh, worst times ahead for me. In fact, if I look at the things that boosted truck profitability in 2021 and 2022, they're all becoming headwinds in 2023 and 2024. If you look at the expenditures per shipment index, you can see how high we are above normal. There's a lot of room for that to come down, and we've only just started coming down. Diesel prices, Oh yeah, it's an operating cost for fleets, but it was also a huge profit source in the fuel surcharges. A lot of companies were making money on fuel surcharging. Guess what? That just turned negative and it's going to be negative all the rest of this year. So that's going away. What about gains on sale? They've been humongous this cycle. Well, guess what? We've gone from ninety-two dollars to $72,000 for a truck and we're probably going to be toward $50,000 as we get closer to the end of the year. So that's coming down this year. And then lastly, spot rates. You can see the blue line. It's not going up the way it should. Now, part of this is because lenders are keeping trucks in the market that shouldn't be. I do think eventually that capacity comes out of the market, but for right now it's in, and that's putting a lot of pressure on rates, and I'm last 24 hours I got a confirmation of that. All right, so uh, let's switch gears. Hold on. There we are. So remember I said corporate profits, they drive decisions. Well, the single best lead indicator of truck demand is carrier profit margins. And here's what concerns me. In the normal downturn, carrier profit margins will be down about three percentage points. So we go from 8% margins to 5% margins, sometimes a little more. The forecast by the Wall Street community is down half a point in this best recession ever. Half a point. Now, I can tell you the two carriers that just reported first quarter earnings, the average was down seven and a quarter points. All right, now it's only two carriers, but there's no way half a point is what we're going to see in this downturn, but that's what's forecast, and that's what's supporting these forecasts for 300,000, 320,000 unit truck years. Now, I don't doubt we're going to see that in 23. I think most of the damage is going to occur at the end of this year into 24. Now, we'll talk about best recession ever, all right? That, that's where it leads us to. So here's the graphic proof that people are relying on, okay? And in this chart, anytime we've been left of zero, we've been in a recession. 
But you can see the last three or four recessions, the margins moved up. People say, hey, our industry is getting better. The driver shortage is limiting capacity. We get better rates. We've been more profitable each time. I'm not denying that. I agree with that. But what I disagree with is the half a percentage point drop from 22 to 23. I think we're looking more like 3%. And we're not going to bounce back to that purple dot 24 in a year. Typically, it takes us two years to get back to that level. 24 is still going to be a tough P&L year for the industry. So just something to think about. Now, here's the part of the this time it's different that I do agree with. And, and some people say, Jeff, why are you so concerned about 24? Because we're going to have the biggest two years in the history of this industry in 2025 and 2026. How do I know that? Because we're going back to the old EPA NOx mandates. And we're going to add $30,000 to the cost of a 2027 model year truck. And nobody wants to do that. No one's going to go EV. No one's going to go fuel cell. We are buying every diesel internal combustion engine vehicle we can afford to buy in 26. And because the OEMs can't make enough to satisfy demand, we're going to start in 25. So the likely scenario is we're going to weaken in 23, but it's still going to be a good year. 24 is probably a worse year than anybody's forecasting. And do we get bent out of shape for that because we know help is on the way in 25 and 26? Maybe we don't. Maybe we use 24 to position for growth. But what I'm saying is just be aware of what 24 might look like. And that could carry into 25 because the truckers are all going to budget their equipment purchases in October of this year. And P&Ls are going to be under a lot of pressure. And in October, they're going to say, yeah, 200 million becomes 100 million. That's what we're doing this year. And we'll see about 25. And they're going to want to see a year of profit recovery before they push the budgets up in 25. So you might not see this hit till mid-25. But yeah, you know, I'm, I don't want you to get bent out of shape for a one-year downturn. But what I'm saying is that, that lake may be deeper than you think. So just think about that as you're planning 24 and you're planning 25. So having said that, here's our estimates. That's a busy table. All I want you to do is pay attention to the top part. It'll be in your slide packets. But we are forecasting a 3% freight downturn in 23. And while a lot of other forecasters are looking for 25 to 3% uptick in 24, we think we're still in a weak economy the first half of 24, so it ends up looking like 1.5% for the year. But it could be down or negative in the first half and then up in the second half. And you could see where that forecast is for Class 8. It's really not that scary, right? So we pull back 10% or 15% for a year, maybe a year and a half. Um, but just something to think about, because I, I do think the economy is going to turn down. And um, anybody uh, remember the movie My Cousin Vinny? Yeah, awesome. One of my favorite movies. I love the line, you know, are you telling me that the laws of physics affecting the rest of the grid-eating population cease to exist on your stovetop? And the answer is no. They exist on the stovetop. And if industry profits come under pressure, this backlog is going to disappear. All right, that's just what happens every cycle. So what am I watching to see if that's happening? I'm watching cancel rates. All right, I'm not seeing, it's going up a little bit. But it's not that bad yet. I'm watching backlogs. Um, and ACT Research, any of you follow them, they're kind of the big think tank for Class 8 vehicles. Um, they're forecasting it gets worse too, but you know, we'll see. Haven't seen it break, but we're getting there. OK, so I'm going to switch gears into some longer term items to think about. So uh, environmental mandates, we're going to hit this on the panel tomorrow, but I just want to talk about it. We've got two government bills, the Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act Bill, that are putting a lot of money out there, uh, tens of billions of dollars into creating infrastructure for electric vehicle fuel cell. We've got CARB, California Research Board, which has some CO2 emissions headlines that are going to tighten. They also have heavy-duty truck omnibus, heavy-duty truck clean fleets that basically mandate that a certain percentage of your fleet needs to become zero emissions vehicles over the course of the next decade. Um, 
Then you got the EPA, which has the 2027 mandate for NOx emissions. That's going to force the pre-buy. And then they're working on greenhouse gas emissions now for 2030 and 2033. And then we have this movement for sustainability by companies that say, you know what, we're looking at our carbon footprint, not just what our business does, but now we're looking through that to the supply chain. And if you're going to be a partner for us, you need to reduce your emissions as well. And that's something that's going to kick in a lot more aggressively in the next two to three years. It's starting now. Some of your dealerships are talking to customers who want to go EV, but they're not really sure where to start. So tomorrow we're actually going to discuss that, some dealers that are involved in that and kind of what they're seeing and, and what they're looking to do. Now, in terms of the sustainability, and I'm just going to throw this up quickly, up till now most companies have only focused on scope one, kind of what is your business doing? But scope three is going to be the big one. This is where we start to look at the supply chain. The SEC, of all people, financial reporting institutions, is going to require most companies to start to report their scope two and scope three emissions. So your customers are going to be able to see through what the companies are doing. And this is really going to force a move into some of these alternative fuel vehicles in the next two to five years. So when do we think you're going to see introduction and adoption for different technologies? Here we've thrown a slide up looking at battery electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles, which I think are going to be the solution for long haul markets. And then autonomous vehicles, something nobody's thinking about, but they are coming. And when they get here, they're going to completely change truck wear cycles. You're going to go from 100,000 miles a year to 200,000 miles a year, and the trucks don't last longer. So it's going to change replacement cycles. It's going to change maintenance cycles. Nothing you really need to focus a whole lot on right now, but I think something you need to be thinking about in terms of this is something people are going to want in three to five years. So what are we going to be prepared to offer? Now, who knows what the future holds? Um, but let me talk about some of the anxiety people are having. With electric trucks, there's range anxiety, there's charging time anxiety, there's infrastructure anxiety. Uh, the range also varies as much as 20% in cold weather. So if the truck advertises 220, you really need to keep it to 160. But, um, and they cost about double what a regular diesel engine is right now. For fuel cells, you don't have the range anxiety or the refueling time anxiety, but you got a big infrastructure anxiety. This is probably the long-term solution for long-haul truckers, um, but we need to solve, I thought it was interesting, British Petroleum's purchase of, of Travel Centers of America, and BP is very focused on hydrogen. Uh, this tells me they're preparing for a world with hydrogen fueling truck stations. Um, not today, not tomorrow, but you do have people stepping up. So here's our best guess of what the cost differentials are for each of these vehicles. You can see fuel cell and battery electric isn't really economic unless you've got um, a voucher program or some kind of support for that. But as technology changes, and there are a lot of new battery technologies that are going to lower the cost of batteries in the next three to five years, you're going to see those cost curves come down. All right, lastly, what does this mean for dealerships? I'm going to try and wrap up in the next two, three minutes here. I think absorption rates are coming down. They've been great. They've been steadily rising for the last decade. They were supercharged the last two years. I, I just think we're moving back toward trend. And the reason I believe that is you've got higher interest costs. You've got higher financing costs. You still have higher labor costs. And even though the maintenance bays are, are going to be busy, um, we think the truck sales component is going to go down in 2024. In terms of what a dealership can do to add value, a couple things we've identified. Digitize. We're going to talk about this on the panel tomorrow. Um, a lot of apps are taking pictures or using those pictures to give drivers the ability to report things on their phone. Organizations are moving this direction. Um, I think a partner like CDK is fantastic in this area with some of the software solutions that they bring to the table. But the point is, you need to be digital. And pe some people are ahead of that. Some people are behind that curve. But that's something that needs to be done. Um, we're seeing a lot of companies focus on mobile service. Some dealerships offer it. Some dealerships don't. But bring it to the customer, preventive maintenance, things like that, instead of the customer having to bring trucks in. Um, be nimble. Your customers' businesses are all changing. Uh, when we talk about fulfillment model changes, vehicle changes, uh, Gen Z is your new employee, and they don't follow email, they don't answer their phone, they text. 
And we've got to figure out how to manage that because this is the future. Um, I think you need to be staffed and stocked with people that are well trained uh, for your customers, particularly as these new technologies are coming online and be a partner. You know, ask where your customers are going. How can you get involved uh, to solve things for them and be part of their business? Um, last slide, I'm gonna go about a minute over here. Uh, Long-term structural changes that some of you may wanna consider. <laughs> um, trailer pools, big thing right now. Uh, this is the way some fleets are solving lack of drivers. But now you're seeing some non-traditional customers start to enter the fray. Companies that were never buyers of trucks are becoming buyers of trailers. So you got new customers now, people like Uber Freight, people like C.H. Robinson, people like these new digital brokers. They're all buying these trailer pools, so something to think about. Um, I talked a little bit about the environmental and carb mandates. Uh, this is something you got to plan for. Some companies are a little more proactive, some are less. Not a big thing right now, but will be in the next three to five years. Um, I mentioned autonomous vehicles. This is going to change the industry dramatically, but we're still probably five to ten years from this being a really, really big deal. Um, fulfillment models are changing. The way Amazon changed retail. Instead of three uh, warehouses all over the country, now you've got 80 regional fulfillment centers. And there's a lot more inventory velocity between these centers, and it's not happening in heavy tractors, it's happening in straight trucks. So straight trucks are part of the new e-fulfillment model and smaller trailers. So this is something that is happening that's kind of a long-term way in coming. Sustainability, I talked a little bit about it, but that's going to become a much bigger issue over the next couple years. Uh, we talked a little bit about digitization, connectivity, and a lot of the truck OEs have their connectivity programs. A lot of the customers are adopting these programs. You get to see maintenance on the fly. You get to watch a driver's driving habits. Um, you know, what can you do at the dealership level to prepare for this and be helpful? And then lastly, uh, reshoring. And this is a 10-year trend that's only starting. This doesn't mean Mexico. There's a lot of new plants and a lot of new factories that are being located in the U.S. You will see them come to life starting in the next two years and lasting for the next 10. But what it means is more freight, more vehicles, and some of your customer movements and chains may change. Um, with that, I want to thank you all for listening.